I'm going to see if I can get two book reviews out this week, because my god, do I have things to say about this one. But until then, Bellmounger, book eight, Court Wizard. As I mentioned in my last review, this one takes place basically during the same time frame as the previous book. It goes a little bit longer, and that's what the next one does too. What's the right way to put it? This? I'd say staggered? Uh, Enchanter goes up to a certain point, and then this one goes over that same time frame and a little longer, and the one, uh, and the one after that goes a little bit long. Okay. You get it, you're not stupid. But it follows Pentandra from the previous books, who, as we, as you've seen from the previous book, is basically Min's best friend. And I feel like these types of novels in this series really help a lot, feel like, make the world feel a bit more realized, because it makes it feel like, if you, like, read the Wheel of Time books, there's, like, an in-universe explanation for basically why everything always happens around these three dudes but that does kind of have an effect of making the world feel kind of small whereas this makes the world feel a little bit more tangibly big you get an understanding that while our first hero is still going through his trials and tribulations which was not too small from if you've actually read the last book is everything everyone else is also going through their own own stuff. So the plot of this book basically starts off with Pentandra's become the court wizard of uh, one of the duchies. Um, I think it's Alshar. And that's somewhat of a problem because half the duchy is in rebellion and the other half is kind of the poor area that nobody really, that's mostly just kept around because eh, some of the dukes like to uh, go hunting and fishing in that area. But in kind of a stoic resolve, the current duke of the area decides that, after some prodding from Min, to rule this area as best he can. Which is a fairly noble thing to do. You should expect that from nobility, but history kind of shows that most nobles are not that way. I also like the contrast I think Terry Mancor is going with Anguin and Tavard. They're the two dukes of the most important duchies to our stories. And one is kind of a spoiled, entitled brat who's had everything handed to him and is kind of awful and distrustful of the mages. And the other is just like, I'm not going to squander this power. I don't really have enough time to really I don't really have enough resources to be denying mages any sort of status or, you know, anything like that. So, uh, one of the problems you get when, like, a nation states, when nation states tend to fail, is that they, <laughs> they lack what is called creative destruction. Creative destruction is just the ability to create new things, and, dis and that might destroy older jobs. Okay, so a tractor is creative destruction, because you're destroying the, the jobs that used to be there for harvesting crops during that time. It allows for a greater amount of people to end up doing other things. Not everyone needs to be farming. And that's just like an example, but you see this all the time. Uh, to pick a more modern example, the self-driving cars, which may or may never become a thing, I don't really know. That's kind of create. That would be a kind of creative destruction as well. Think about it this way. Uh, with the amount of time we spend driving in the United States, which I don't know how many people watch this are not from the states but basically everyone drives here because everything is that far away what could you be doing in that free time and that's one of the advantage and that's the advantage of creative destruction many times leaders of autocratic societies or feudal ones more aptly don't like this sort of thing because it challenges their power base Anguin doesn't really have the option not to do that and I'm kind of getting bogged down in th things. If you want to know more about this, read the book Why Nations Fail. It's an interesting subject, but along the way to get the duchy run it up and running again, Pentandra's put in charge of uh, getting the... They've been mentioned a few times before in this series, but it's a criminal organization known as the Rat Crew out of the city because they basically have a stranglehold on the commerce in the city. So the way they go about doing that is by invoking Huin's Law, I think. I, I don't know. There are three there are three main gods of the pan of their uh, of the Narasi pantheon 
Huin, Duin, and Luin got it. It's the god of agriculture, the god of laws, and the god of war. Worth noting that that's kind of the perfect metaphor for the necessities of feudal life. But there's also the god that's like known as the god of god of thieves and uh, travelers, that kind of thing. And a lot of apparently, you know, I just thought that the, the gods Huin, Duin, and Luin kind of just remind me of the what is it like? Uh, Donald Duck's nephews, Huey, Dewey, and Louie. I mean, given the origin of humans on Kalidor, I, you know, <laughs> that could not be, that might not be a coincidence, <laughs> but whatever. Pentandra's put in charge of a rival gang that basically, that cracks down hard on these people in ways that are not exactly nice, but I guess they are effective. But that's mostly just the setup as the main climax of the book has more to do with this new group that we're just... This new group of um, alcohol lawn that was just unearthed, literally, the Enshadowed, which, as it turns out, are the group actually behind Shrule, uh, the the dead god, and they start to poke up ever, and they start to pop up every now and then too, mostly to be arrogant assholes who are easy to hate. But they're basically. Um, alcohol on necromancers which everyone finds distasteful but they just want to say we want to live forever and is that really a crime and to which i had to say i think when you're killing other people it is yes i mean theoretically immortality is possible uh, all you need to do is uh i believe the thing that causes aging in most animals is a degradation of telomeres Whatever, it's basically the outside of your genetic code, um, for lack of a better term. That's a metaphor, not really. And that degrades over time, and that's what actually causes aging. And it is theoretically possible to make sure that that doesn't happen, which means immortality is technically possible. Maybe. We don't we don't really know. But I, I think I draw the line at taking your brain and... and shoving it into another person that's that that's kind of not good along with this pentandra also gets a new um apprentice because she's never really had one before and this one kind of gets thrust upon her by an old hedge witch you see the gimmick with this hedge witch lady is that she's actually a prophet and can see the and can see the future and this is one of those fantasy stories where uh, foretelling is basically treated like well, me and again like the Wheel of Time. Ah, crap, it's a prophecy. But seriously, what does it say? And one of the things I noticed about this, uh, one of the first things you'll notice it, it brought up about this apprentice, her name is Allura, is that she's a blind girl. She can't see at all. Uh, she actually uses uh, other animals to see through magic, basically. It's just uses, she uses magic to see through other animals' eyes, basically, and that's kind of a cool concept but i find it kind of funny that it's like a i don't know if this is a trope but it's something i notice more and more frequently that there's always a whenever somebody who's blind shows up in fantasy it's always because they can see greater than other people in some way uh i mean even world of warcraft has this with illidan he's blind but he sees with spectral sight and allows him to see better than other people I hate Illidan. I don't know why, but that just seems to be a common trope I've noticed. So this Allura girl has some knowledge of what's going to happen in the future. The blind can see in ways that we can't or something like that. I don't know. The Book of Eli. You ever see that that movie? Yeah, that kind of thing. I do have to say that I think Allura has probably one of the best lines in the entire book when she tells Ishii, the Narasi love god, quote, you're kind of a cunt. I love how that's the complete bookend to the scene and the way it is said and the way <laughs> that it is again and the fact that it is a hundred percent true is it's great. Which brings up another major plot point of this entire book. The love goddess Ishii is in the area and she's in causing as enough ruckus as a love god actually does. Oh, not necessarily doing bad things. Um, basically how magic ends up working in this universe. The love god or the radiates divine energy of the quote life force, which is really good against the undead because they don't like that. So she has her uses in that regard. Uh, I think one of the Nemavorte 
actually literally screams about how she's burning them or something and it's just like wow it's really you know the entire aspect of the gods in this universe really makes you wonder at the wisdom of um what was the plans of some of the nimaborti they uh, want to quote corral humans and kind of keep them as domesticated but it seems like if you did something like that 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 would just create an incredibly pissed off god that would would do something that probably would screw everything up. Spoo for thought on that one. But yeah, Ishii, um, her major contribution is something that ends up being called Ishii's Night, which there's no way on Kuth way to say this again. It's like a three day long orgy. Because it's a love god, and this is the more of the Greco-Roman interpretation of a love go god, which means they're kind of irresponsible, capricious, and short-sighted. But again, this is, but again, there is a point to it all. It wants to ha make everyone have a lot more children. No, it happens again to disrupt some of the undead activities in the city. I gotta say, as far as weaknesses to undead, the holy light, the radiant sun fucking orgy i i'm you know i'm gonna put that one up at the top the top as ways i would want to fight the undead you know there's a lot of uh world of warcraft fans who i think would really like to fight certain undead that way too one of the other things i was thinking of while i was reading this book is that pentandra is just really a good friend she recognizes right away that something is wrong with min after the event in the last book and she's trying not to impose on him too much i think min literally says to her at one point you're basically, you and Alia are basically the only women I want to be around right now. And that makes a lot of sense from me, from my point of view. Not to mention, after the climax of the last book, the commenter told me to go full spoilers, so full spoilers, Alia is basically put into a comatose state. You get to hear, and you get to see a lot of Pentandra's thoughts on, on how she would have coached Min before this, and how she's doing, going about it, and going about it now because of her recent nuptials and the way she just understands her friend while also lending like a, an ear to listen to i don't know i just think we all could use a friend like pentandra yeah one of the greater revelations uh, kind of in this book is all right do you remember when i was doing the first book review and i made the point a point about say about pointing out that the differing levels of spellmongers in the um, Beauval Vale were also had differing levels of um, showmanship, for lack of a better ter term, that was the really unpretentious head wizard dude who just did what he did and everyone knew, knew it and he didn't feel a need about, need about making a show of it. Then you had Min, who was somewhere in the middle on that, that but he was like, admittedly, I'm not as great about this as other people. And then you had Gurkescu, who made a big show of basically everything. Of be even the most basic and simple things to try and impress people remember how i pointed out that that was all pointed out right before you got to the alcohol on embassy in the area and they're and they are really putting on this show of being ethereal and above all all the petty human squabbling yeah that was a very apt uh foreshadowing <laughs> as it turns out the alcohol on have a lot of skeletons in their closet I guess literally, considering their biggest issue is the aforementioned demon god of the Mindens, Corbel, who it's revealed is a Alcalon who does not agree with the current council at all. And most of the trouble stirred up in in Boval Vale was due to a fa that faction, the aforementioned faction of Enshadowed. This gets basically stated in this book. Pentandra's just like, look, you're fucking with us. You know you did this, and now you're just trying to use us as a shield. We're gonna be partners from now on. You can't, you can't just use us as your attack hound. And I felt like that was a good use of making an immortal feel flawed, but also different from humans. There's a weird trend I've noticed in a lot of fantasy that if you, if you want to make a, uh, if you want to do a twist on like elves or dwarves is you just basically make them humans, but this does not feel like that. This feels like a unique, tr this feels like a unique set of circumstances that were born out of the Alcolon's long life and perspective on things. They feel view humans' lives as basically being 
ephemeral. It's like, well, it's difficult to, any, to talk to you people because you'll all die within a hundred years or something. I'm like, okay, bitch, you're making me miss the Asari. Asari. Now, they really dig in with the, you don't have the ears to understand. Mm. But we really don't. Okay, sure, but Nana doesn't have to be so snotty about it. I mean, again, supports my assertion about this series is that it's realistic, not pessimistic. And again, the Alkalon aren't necessarily bad people. They're just long-lived people who, who have the same faults that you would imagine any sort of long-lived person would have. And the uh, last note I have on this, I took actual notes this time. The way Pentandra gets Ishii to stop meddling so much is kind of the perfect metaphor. For lack of a better term, she calls her mom. Uh, Trig, the mother goddess, uh, shows up in this book at the end. She doesn't gain continuity like the last few gods to get it. She will in, like, I think the next two books. But Pentandra has, like, this really nice speech at the end of the book about how the capriciousness of uh, love and youth and stuff about uh, love in infatuation and youth that kind of thing kind of gives way in time to motherhood and commitment and that whole thing and i just think the i think i just think it's kind of the perfect metaphor to have the love goddess basically removed from the area or kind of put set in her place by the mother goddess you know just kind of like how the capriciousness of youth gives way to the maturity of motherhood or uh, motherhood and i suppose fatherhood that kind of thing and that kind of thing i don't know i just i liked that metaphor in the series i, I thought it was cool i don't really have much to say about on it i guess it was a little bit on the nose like hey do you get it so i don't know if this one really counts as a review it was a lot more of just sort of a rumination or a summary I, I don't think i even did a good job summarizing things there are plenty of things i didn't even really mention but suffice it to say at the end Patandra has a book of prophecies that she's debating whether or not she reads we don't actually find out if she does nothing's gonna stop me now wait there was a prophecy oh now there's a prophecy by the way if you enjoy this series you should probably watch this uh podcast with terry mancor on it on the channel Maji Q. I'll leave a link in the description. I just came across it at the end of editing this video. Figured I'd throw this in here at the end.